Back on the MSG 150 at Home, presented by Chase, Bill Pito, Steve Aliquet, and Alan Hahn. And it is our pleasure to say hello to our pal, EJ Raddick from NHL Network. EJ, it is so great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be seen. Good to see all you guys. I missed you all. Uh, Valley still has never gotten over. We'll never get over the times that you have beaten him in terms of shooting the puck past him on the ice. He talks brought, about it on a regular basis. I brought a little Once momentum. Right here. You remember this, <laughs> EJ? Come on now, EJ. Yes, come on. Hey, Valley, I remember when I put on the goalie stuff, and when you were dumb enough to shoot from the blue line, <laughs> I stopped all 10. And then when you moved up, I had a little more trouble. So, yeah, I found it back in that segment that my stick was broken. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, to the real game, guys, the NHL, it's been a week, uh, EJ, since Commissioner Gary Bettman announced the structure for the return to play. Uh, you've had a week now to think about things. How do you think things are going to proceed? Well, I mean, I, I wish I exactly had the answer to for that, Bill. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, are going to have to happen. You know, this is a long journey that we're on to perhaps play games in maybe the end of July or early August to start this uh, playoff tournament. And uh, the league is going to try to navigate their way through all these different hurdles and all these different things that are going to be you know, in the way, this is going to be a huge undertaking to try to get this done. But, uh, you know, I think they've managed this as best they could so far. And uh, they're going to do everything in their power to try to get there. But let's face it, there's a lot. This is a fluid situation. There is a lot of unknowns out there uh, in a lot of different circumstances now. So uh, time will tell if they can get there. But I think, the, you know, the plan is as fair as it could be under the circumstances. And it would be wonderful to see these guys have a chance to play for the Stanley Cup. And I'm sure people would love to, to watch it, regardless of what time of the year it is. Yeah, that's a great point. It, it's, it really doesn't matter what time of year it is. But, of course, it'll be very unique to watch hockey. Yeah, yeah. It is August and, and even and into September. Um, but just talk about the importance of this sport, especially in comparison to the other sports, making sure they finish their season and also maybe getting different people watching this sport now because of when they're playing and also the fact that we haven't seen live sports in so long. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, guys. I mean, this is a business like all businesses are out there. And the National Hockey League is a business that, uh, you know, they depend a lot on gate revenues, maybe more than some of the other leagues. So that's out of the picture right now. Uh, they obviously have a certain amount of television revenues that they would like to collect if they have a playoff uh, tournament to go all the way through to the Stanley Cup final. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a business. And to your point, Alan, I think it's a really good point, is it's a different time of year, and people are watching things that they might not normally watch. I mean, people are really looking for these kind of things. I mean, I found myself watching more horse racing because that was on. I watch more of the, go the golf with Tiger Woods and, and the EJ, you play any bets or what? I, I might have made a few wagers, Bill. <laughs> you know, they might not have been that successful. But uh, at any rate, I mean, people are looking. You're right. People are looking for different things. And so uh, I think it would be a, an opportunity in some ways for the league. And, and let's face it. I mean, they played almost their whole season. These guys have been pretty much paid throughout the whole year. So there's not that element you're seeing in some of the other sports. The guys, for the most part, want to play. If it's safe to do so, I think they're going to try to do it. It would be great business for the league. And then when it's over in September or whenever they can finish, we probably won't see it again until December or January. And who knows with this possibility of a second wave, how it's all going to play out. So in the end, I think that's the biggest reason they would like to get this done in the summer. EJ, you and I worked together seven years ago now already on Hockey Night Live. And it seems like a lifetime ago. EJ, the <laughs> advice you gave me, Valley, you're going to hit turbulence sometimes when you're speaking on camera. Yeah. Fly through it. Seems very fitting for the times that we're in right now. Uh, in terms of fairness, uh, the context. Like this, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what he used to do, too. <laughs> it can be bumpy. It can be bumpy. It's going to get off the rails. Fly through it. Yeah. Fly and through it. Um, But in terms of fairness, EJ, uh, do you think the return to play that the NHL proposed and obviously accepted by the players is fair? Well, I know under normal circumstances, probably isn't 100% fair. I mean, look at what's gone on. Look at the East, right? The Montreal Canadiens are in and, you know, the Devils and Sabres are out. And, you know, you go to points percentage and games played. The, the Devils, if they had beaten the Penguins the last game, they'd be in. I mean, the Pen I think the Canadians were getting ready to play the Buffalo Sabres when the pause occurred. So, in normal circumstances, no, it's probably not fair. But these aren't 
normal circumstances. The plane, as you like to point out there, is rocking right now. It is turbulent times. And I think the league is doing what they can to try to, you know, keep their business moving forward and try to create something, uh, you know, of a playoff format that works for as many people and can be as fair for as many teams as possible. And I think, you know, nobody's going to be completely happy. But in, in these circumstances, I mean, a, a situation like this where nobody's completely happy, maybe that, that tells you that it's fair in its own way. Yeah. EJ, fans in the arena, such a big factor in hockey and in the playoffs in particular. What do you think the impact's going to be with no fans in the stands? It's going to be strange. I mean, you know, it's really going to be odd, and I think it's something that the players are going to have to get used to. I think they will because these guys are professionals, and, I mean, they practice. They've been playing their whole lives. They've been in situations where they've played where there's, you know, really not that many people there. So it is different for sure, and it's one of the reasons why I feel like the experienced teams and the older players who have that experience of life will probably benefit because, first of all, those guys, some of those guys are older guys, are rested, and they will be rested by the time we get playing. And second of all, you know, they've dealt with some of the ups and downs in life and some of the unusual circumstances, and they may be better suited to, uh, to you know, to, to, to kind of figure out a way to, to play through something that's unusual for them, at least at this point. So, uh, it's going to be odd. There's no question about it. I mean, to be playing in one place, there's no travel issues from each side in, in the different conferences, so that's the good news. But to play in a building where there's virtually nobody there is odd. And there won't, you won't have any home ice advantage because not only will you not have fans, no one's really going to have a home ice. You know, we, yeah. they need a, a 10 hub cities or 10 potential places that they could use uh, right now as as hub sites for a lot of these games. What are you hearing about which cities seem to be standing out more than others as potential sites? Well, I mean, everybody has talked about Las Vegas, right? Because of the idea that they have so much hotel space there. The, uh, the rink, the uh, T-Mobile Arena is a state-of-the-art building. They have the practice facility, which is in uh, Summerlin, which is about a 20-minute ride from, uh, from the strip area where the, where the arena is. So there's a lot of positives there. Although when you think about Las Vegas in July and August, I've been there, and it's really – really hot and uh yeah. you know i understand that dan craig and his group they can make things happen and that's a brand new building i'm sure they could do their best to to keep the ice uh, as good as they could possibly keep it but it really that's one of those things that people don't think about it will be extremely hot there at that time of year so that's a that's a problem and also as we move forward here and i think it's good and i think it's one of the reasons the league way has kind of been waiting on this Las Vegas may open up at some point soon. It looks like some of the casinos are going to start opening up, I think, even this week. How Las Vegas looks in July and early August and into September when they're trying to do some of this is different than it looks now. And maybe it's not as appealing for the league that's trying to keep guys kind of out of the mix, so to speak, and keep guys, uh, you know, kind of quarantined in their own little loop there. So I have heard a lot about Vegas. Uh, L.A. made a pitch late. But, you know, now – also, another factor here was with all the, you know, the situation on the ground in a lot of cities right now, that could change the dynamic of things. So uh, there's a lot to think about for the league right now, and I think it could go any number of ways. There's three Canadian cities. Can we get across the border? Can guys get over from Europe? I mean, as I said earlier, there's going to be a lot to navigate for the league to make this happen. Uh, EJ, once upon a time, I was the player rep for the New York Rangers, and I would represent the guy's message in the locker room. And when I went to meetings in the summertime, the message from the Rangers locker room was, Valley, get training camps to be shorter. And the funny thing right now is that the players actually want the training camp to be a little bit longer, starting somewhere around July 10th. I'm hearing that a lot of people are looking at possibly getting consultants uh, in sports science, maybe just to help everybody through the transition of a different style of training camp. Are you hearing anything like that, EJ? I think that they, you know, teams will try, teams are always looking for an edge, right? I mean, you guys know that. So, I mean, they're, I'm sure teams would be looking for some kind of advantage, but they're going to be limited in how many people they can have within their traveling group. I think that the number is going to be 50 in terms of coaches, yeah. players, uh, you know, staff, uh, trainers, that sort of thing. So it's not necessarily a big number. And they might also have, obviously they may need extra players. So those guys might be included in that number as well. So, uh, you know, I think it's something that teams will look at. They'll look to study any ways they can get an advantage in a, in a training camp scenario where teams haven't done anything and they haven't really even skated very much for, depending upon where you are in the world for the last, you know, three or four months. So I think that will be limited Valley just by the number of people each team can bring to the site. 
EJ, as for the Rangers, they're supposed to play the Hurricanes in the qualifying round. And I think it's fascinating because right. there were two teams that reportedly voted against this playoff structure. Right. One of those teams was Carolina. So what right. kind of dynamic might that bring to the series? Well, they didn't I mean, for the Rangers. Carolina. Yeah, yeah. well, listen, you look, you go 0-4 against the team during the regular season, and the numbers are really are not good for Carolina over the last 10 years. Now, for much of that time, the Rangers were the far superior team, so that would make sense. But this year, Carolina was 0-4, and, and uh, I can remember Henrik Lundqvist playing a couple really good games against the Carolina Hurricanes, which brings us to, if we get there, Shesterkin, Georgiev, Lundqvist. I mean, that is, uh, you know, a thing that they will, David Quinn and that group will have to look at if and when we get there, how they perform in training camp. As I mentioned earlier, experience could play into this. Lundqvist has played very well against the Canes. So it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting series for a lot of reasons. I mean, Brady Shea just traded at the deadline from the Rangers to the, to the Hurricanes. You have Adam Fox, his story kind of forcing his way out of Carolina via trade to the Rangers. Uh, the season series, as you mentioned, I mean, good goaltending has been the key for the Rangers' wins in those games. Valley will always tell you, good goaltending is really what you need. And uh, the Rangers have had just that. And that's where they have a big advantage. I mean, they've got three guys who are really good. All three are probably better than Peter Morazic. So, uh, on the flip side, the Canes do get back Dougie Hamilton if we get to play. So, uh, be a fun series. It's probably one of the more intriguing uh, qualifying round matchups if we get there. Another team, too, that had great success against their matchup of the Islanders against the yep. Panthers. So with that in mind, and you also mentioned experience important, goaltending important, yep. but also defense, a defensive system, which is what Barry Trotz has. What do you see in that series for the Islanders? Well, I listen, I, I agree with everything you're saying, Alan. I, I like, uh, you know, Barry Trotz with an experienced group there. The, the big thing for me for the Islanders, they get uh, Adam Pellick back, right? Because it looks like he'll be healthy enough to play. And as I, you know, anybody following the Islanders will tell you that guy is kind of an under the radar important player for the Islanders. When he went out, it it was it made that team. You know, they struggled a little bit more, but with him back in the lineup there, all of a sudden the Islanders are kind of more at full strength there. I think it'll really depend for me with the Islanders on how Varlamov plays. Uh, you know, he's had his ups and downs this season. They give you the hit. They play good defense in front of him. But, uh, you know, there's been moments this year when, you know, he's been, uh, you know, not the guy that maybe they were hoping for. I think he will be the guy that gets the opportunity. Remember last year, it was, it was Robin Leonard all the way, basically till the end before they would take a chance and go with Thomas Christ. So, uh, you know, we'll see. But uh, I think Pellick being back is a huge help for the Islanders. All right, EJ. Hey, we'll leave it there. It's so great to see right. you. So Good to great. see you guys. Love you, EJ. Good to see you, buddy. Love Thanks you for you and your family. All right, buddy. Rematch. <laughs> EJ Raddick uh, from NHL Network. Coming up, we're going to set the table for what's on the network tonight, including one of the best individual playoff performances by a Nick ever. And we'll talk about that when we come back on the MSG 150 at Home, presented by Chase. <laughs>